Yeah. So generally there's about four main categories I think of when I want to animate a photo in After Effects. The transforms, like adding Z depth and moving a camera through a scene. Distortions, like wave warp to distort flags or water and liquefy to change facial expressions. There's puppet warping, which is pretty much a distortion, but I like to give it its own category since it's so versatile. I go with that for adjusting poses or displacing anything that needs a bit more control. And finally, the enhancers, which is pretty much just everything else rolled into one. Like if there's candles in a scene, you can animate some glow and make it flicker a little bit, or even use particle effects to create fake snow, just generally anything else you add on top. And the order I just laid them out in is usually the order I follow when I'm working on stuff too. So let's just go straight to a demo here and start with step one, transforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for transforming, the most important thing is establishing the layers that make up a photo. If for example you only have a photo of a person in front of a wall, you've got two layers there, the person and the wall. And that's fine, but generally it's going to be a lot more convincing if you can get at least three layers in the photo. A foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Because that way when you separate the Z position and move a camera through a scene, you're going to get parallax which will sell the depth of the scene a lot better. So once you have a photo and you've decided what the layers are going to be for it, you'll either want to mask them out very carefully in After Effects or just cut them out in any other photo editing program like Photoshop, like I did, and then just save it as a PNG. Now comes the fun part, creating our fake 3D scene. Before we get started though, make sure that all your layers are 3D layers and create a new camera. Now go ahead and select all the layers and hit P to bring up the position and holding shift hit S also so that we can bring up the scale as well. I usually start with my background layer and just send it way back in Z-space, and then just scale it back up. You can get the middle ground where it needs to be just by looking at the foreground and background Z position, and then putting in a number that seems about right within that range. Now you don't have to be accurate at all for this, this is just to get some base values so that when we create a camera move we can just play it back and see what feels right, what feels wrong, and adjust our values from there. To create a camera move we have to twirl down the transform of the camera, and animate the point of interest and position. Then move the timeline forward and click and hold on the camera tool. Here there's a couple options for animating the camera, we're only going to be concerned with the track X and Y and the track Z. For the camera move that I'm after, and also to check whether our Z positions are good, I'm going to choose track X and Y, and then holding shift and dragging to the right, I'm going to be moving the camera to the left. Now because the background is just a straight up photo, and the foreground and middle ground are just cutouts of that photo, we're going to be seeing copies of them in the background as we move around. We'll be covering them up after we finish animating, but to minimize the amount of work we have to do, it's easier if we move the camera to the left half as much as we originally wanted to, and then as the starting keyframe, we'll move the camera to the right. That way, instead of having a lot to cover up on one side, we'll be covering up half as much on both sides. Now we can feel out if a layer needs to be pushed back further or moved in closer. If you find that the layer is moving with the camera too much, send it further back, and if you find that it's moving too little, bring it closer. Once we have all our layers arranged in Z-Space how we like it, we can start the cover up. Normally I'd do this in Photoshop because it's got a lot more tools to help make this easy, but for the sake of the video, I'll do it all in After Effects. Essentially what we're going to be doing is covering up the elements of the foreground and midground layer that are in the background layer, so that when we scrub through our camera move we don't see duplicates of anything. To make this job easier, the first thing we need to do is apply a fill effect to our foreground layer. Next we'll drag the composition panel onto the side so that it snaps into its own view, select the clone stamp tool up here, and then double click the background layer. This should open up the background in a layer panel on the right side. Okay, so if you aren't familiar with the clone stamp tool, it's basically a brush that lets you copy and paste sections of the photo and paint using them. The setup I like to use with this tool is a flow around 50% to help blend things more. Make sure the painting mode is constant to make sure that everything you end up fixing up isn't just there for one frame only. And then I prefer to turn off the aligned mode on the tool. So if we hold Alt or Option on a Mac and click a spot, you're telling the clone stamp tool that you want to copy that part of the photo and use it to paint with. If you have aligned turned on, the source that you're copying from isn't always going to start in that same spot. If I paint a bit, stop painting, and then start again, you'll see that the source is moved in relation to the brush. I'm not a fan of that because I always want to know what I'm painting with and I don't want it to be a surprise to me, so that's why I keep aligned off. And now I'll just start painting so you can see how I do it and what it looks like. Also one more tip here, if you hold Control or Command on a Mac and drag your mouse, you can change the size of the brush without having to go into a whole different panel. When you're doing this, obviously keep looking over at the composition view on the left so that you know how much you actually have to replace and how much you can just leave as it is. Generally, stuff in the background is going to be out of focus, so you can get away with a lot of stuff that just doesn't make sense. As long as it looks close enough, no one will really notice. And here's another reason why I don't have my brush set to aligned. Holding Alt, I just set the source to the middle of this guy's boot. And then just by putting my brush in the middle of where I wanted a boot to be and painting outwards, I was able to give all these guys feet pretty easily. You're welcome. 
for the feet. Now, if you started painting from anywhere but the start of the comp, make sure you head down here, select all the brush strokes, and drag the start out to have the whole timeline covered. Otherwise, your clone stamp changes are only going to pop into existence once you hit that point in the timeline. Now we can just drag the composition panel back to the other ones and take a look what we did. Alright, so now we're on to step two, which are distortions. There's a bunch of tools here to help you get what you're after. For example, for flags or water, you might want to try wave warp. For candles, you can try turbulent displace. For shifting clouds over, you can try mesh distort. And for things like small expression changes, you can try liquify. I recommend you just sift through all of these and see what each of them do so you can get familiar with it. And then once you know what they all do, just get creative and use whichever tool helps you the most. For this photo, wave warping the flags is what I'm going to start off with. The first thing I want to do though is select the background layer, pre-compose it, and then leave all attributes. That way the clone stamp painting as well as any 3D position stuff we've done stay in the main comp and we're free to add distortions to just the original plain photo version. A great thing about most of these distortions and displacements is that they work with adjustment layers. So I'll just add a new one here and add the wave warp effect to it. Now we've got to fine tune the settings and add masks to cover just the flag so that the whole photo doesn't get wave warped like this. These waves are too close together by default, so I'll start by increasing the wave width a bunch right off the bat. I'll also take the wave height down a lot too so that we're left with a more subtle and natural looking effect. Next I'll just play it back to see how it looks, and I notice that it's going way too fast, so we'll just set that speed to 0.5 and it should be good to go. Now comes the masking. I'll need to go ahead and individually mask out each flag, and a great thing about this is that it doesn't have to be perfect since they're out of focus and in the background. So I'll just do a loose mask around each one, then we can add a feather and then turn off the mask line so that we can check and make sure it's looking good. One thing I realized is that it's kind of obvious that all of the flags are waving with the same effect because the ones that are close together are all waving in unison and it just looks fake. There are two ways we can go about fixing this. So one way would be to duplicate the adjustment layers two or three times and then have each adjustment layer control one or two flags and then tweak the phase of each one's warp effect so that they're not all warping to the same motion. Honestly, that's the quickest way to do it, but another way I wanted to bring up in case you didn't know is how to apply masks to specific effects on the same layer. If we select the adjustment layer and hit E to show the effects on it, we can expand the wave warp and click the plus on the compositing options to add a mask to that effect. So we'll just do that twice and pick two flags, and now we'll select the wave warp effect and hit Ctrl D to make a copy of it. And then go to the second wave warp's compositing options, select the masks for two more flags, and repeat. For these flags that are up front, I'm going to increase the wave height just a little bit because as they're closer to the camera, the waves would just naturally look a little bit bigger. And for organization's sake, I'll just rename this layer to Flag Warps. One more thing that I think would help this photo is to make Ramsey smirk a bit. So I'll head back to the main comp, pre-compose the foreground layer, and leave all attributes. And then inside the pre-comp, we'll make a new adjustment layer, rename it, and add the liquify effect. If you've used Photoshop before, there's a good chance you know what Liquify is, but basically there's a couple tools here that let you brush on distortions to the layer. For example, the Bloat tool makes things bulge out, the Pucker tool will do the opposite, and there's a few others that aren't too useful or important. But what is important is the Warp Brush. With this one selected and the brush pressure not set too high, I'll just begin to slowly distort his face to where I want the final expression to be. Now try to keep it subtle because if you warp it too much over a short period of time, it's going to draw attention to itself. So I'm going to keep it as subtle as I can. And once I'm happy with it, I'll animate the distortion percentage from 0 to 100. And also just because I can, I'll select these keyframes, hit F9 to ease them and get rid of those disgusting linear keyframes. Awesome, I'll move on to step 3 now, which is puppet warping. This is a super useful way to add some subtle distortions that you can keyframe. While the Liquify Tools warp brush we just used is really good for small detailed distortions, the puppet pin is just better for larger motion. Instead of brushing our changes on and animating the overall distortion percentage, with the puppet pin we're warping using pins that we stick into the layer. These pins give you a lot of control over your distortion because you can animate each one independently. Alright, so instead of hopping back into Ramsey's pre-comp, we're going to apply the puppet warp right here. There's a couple reasons for that. So first of all, the point of the pre-comp is to be able to apply effects on an unmoving version of the photo, and the puppet warp won't work properly if we put it on an adjustment layer. That means we'd have to add the puppet warp to the photo layer directly, and that would then result in moving that layer, which would mess up all the other effects we put on adjustment layers above it. The second reason I like to stay in the main comp for this is that we can see the motion of the camera and kind of use that to inform how we want to puppeteer our character. So clicking the pin tool up here, there's a couple options if you hold down left click. 
There's actually a lot to go over about these, so to keep it brief, if you want to animate the position of a pin, just go with the regular puppet pin. And if you want to use rotation as well, go over and use the advanced pin. Alright, so the tool is really powerful, and as a result of it being so good, it's a little bit finicky sometimes. If I just set a pin down on his neck, for example, you can see that it automatically creates keyframes for the pin's properties. Because the pin I have selected is the advanced pin, it's keeping track of more than just the position, as you can see. If I move forward in the timeline then, and rotate the pin though, you'll see that the whole thing moves instead of just his neck. That's because it's working how you'd think sticking a pin in something would work. If I go back to the start and add pins around where his neckline starts for example, you'll see that now only the neck and above are affected. So just be aware that to get what you're after, you're more than likely going to have to be sticking pins down just to keep things in place. Anyways, I'll just get rid of all these and we'll start the real deal now. I only need to animate the position of these pins so I'm going to go with the normal puppet pin tool. Like the other distortion effects, it's best to be more subtle, otherwise you're going to draw too much attention to the fact that it's warping. Now with this photo, I imagine his body language would get a little bit more threatening with that smirk, so I'll start by straightening out his shoulders a bit since he's leaning back slightly. I'll place some pins on his two shoulders, and then one where I think the center of his chest is, and then just stick a pin in the horse to stop the whole photo from rotating when I move the other pins. Moving to the end of the timeline, I'll grab the pins for his chest and shoulders and move them up and forward to kind of adjust his posture a bit. After playing around with the pins some more, I'll stick some more down his arm and kind of bring them forward too. I find it's good to move your pins with intention and try to ignore the weird deforming that happens, and then just add in all the other stabilizing pins and then tweak from there. Now once you've got a motion that you're happy with, don't forget that this movement is all keyframed, so you can ease them if it helps your motion, as well as play around with the speed graph to fine tune the look. I'm going to have him straighten up a little bit quicker and then smooth out the end of this movement here because I think that would make it feel a bit more aggressive. By the way, if you want to learn more about how powerful the speed and value graph are, as well as a bunch of other tips, I've got a video on them that you can check out by hitting the I in the top right corner of your screen, or you could just head over to my channel and take a look. Alright, so now that we're done with the Puppet Warp tool, the last step is the enhancers, which again are all the other smaller effects that I add on top. For this one, I'm going to bring Ramsey into focus as he smirks to kind of draw more attention to it. So in the main comp, I'll add a Gaussian blur to all of the scene's layers, foreground, midground, and background. Since I'll be pulling focus onto Ramsey, at the start I'll have the background be at 0% blur, and I'll bump up the blur on Ramsey a bunch. I feel like with blurs it's really easy to go overboard and make stuff look cheesy, so as like a running theme throughout this whole video, a tip I have for you is just go more subtle than you think. One thing here to be careful of is that if your layer has a puppet warp on it, adding blur afterwards sometimes creates these little artifacts that you can see here. Thankfully it's really easy to get around this, just move the blur up on the effect stack so that it's blurring the photo before the puppet warp is warping the photo. Now moving forward, I'll add my second set of keys just before he begins smirking and set his blur to zero. Then I'll head over to the background layer and increase its blur a bunch. And just like how we found the Z positions earlier, I find that it's easier to set the blur for the foreground and background first, so that you can eyeball the middle ground layer's blur a little bit more easily. Now there's always more we can do with it, but I just wanted to let you know the main steps I take, and how I do them, and now you can get creative with it and make your own. Here's a quick rundown of a few extra things I added to this. So noticing that the soldiers on the left are a lot further away than those on the right, I decided to split the background layer in two, using Ramsey's body to hide the seam. That way I could push the soldiers on the left side a little further back and bring those on the right a little closer. Honestly, the difference isn't huge, but it adds more complexity to the parallax and that helps sell the depth of the scene better. Now if you have the ability to add more movement in the background, you're going to make the photo seem much more alive. And I mean usually the background is the easiest to manipulate since it's either out of focus or just really small and taking up a small portion of the frame. One more thing that I did to do that was to mask out the spear and animate it slightly, just so that the flags aren't the only thing in the background that are moving. And pretty much the last thing I did was I added some layers of fog. Now you can just grab some footage off of YouTube or somewhere else of like some fog rolling in front of a camera. I was a bit lazy so I just created a new solid, added turbulent displace to it, played with the levels and evolution of it, and then set the blending mode to screen. Basically creating some really subtle and faint fog. Then I just set the opacity way down and duplicated it three times. I put one layer at the very front in front of everything, the next layer I put behind Ramsey in front of the middle ground in the background, and then the last layer I put behind the middle ground and just in front of the background. And that's pretty much it. So thank you so much for watching the video all the way through. If I was able to help you out, consider subscribing and turning on notifications. That way you'll be the first to know when I put out a new tutorial. Well, this is awkward. Can't, uh, can't help but notice you didn't hit that subscribe button yet. Just wondering when I can, just wondering when I could expect to, you know, receive the subscription, as it were. Uh, you know, take your time.
but I would appreciate it sooner rather than later, as I would like to say thank you to you. And thank you, thank you so much. That was really nice of you to do that.